Japan uh, Roundtable, and I would like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, our guests in, uh, and, and, and, and start on time. Uh, excellencies, esteemed guests, dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you all to the first roundtable of the Antalya Diplomacy Forum as the facilitator of this session. And in this roundtable with very valuable speakers and experts, we will explore models that involve third party guarantee, uh, guarantees in establishing security arrangements, security guarantees, and specifically focusing on the Middle East uh, conflict, uh, Gaza conflict. Uh, today, uh, you know, as you all know, we're witnessing one of the most violent and traumatic periods in the history of the region, Middle East, especially with the devastating war in Gaza that claimed more than 30,000 lives so far. Today, we have eight uh, speakers all experts on conflict resolution, especially the role of third parties in providing security arrangements on this round table. Uh, for the sake of time, I will introduce them one by one when it's uh, sort of, uh, you know, when we uh, go to our speakers. Uh, but together we will explore um, questions uh, like um, what type of third party guarantorship models uh, have been implemented in other conflicts, uh, which of these would better suit the needs of peace and security in the broader Middle East, particularly the Gaza conflict. What strategies, activities can the third party guarantors focus on to ensure peace and security in the Middle East Gaza conflict? What are some of the best practices learned uh, from other conflicts around the world about the role of third party uh, guarantors, especially in monitoring and implementing security guarantees, security arrangements? What are some of the challenges third party guarantors face in carrying out their responsibilities? to ensure compliance with security arrangements. Um, so around the, um, and, and, and how, uh, so we'll explore some, of some cases, but also some models, frameworks that exist uh, on the topic. And we have, um, first we will start with uh, Chiara Ayar. Uh, from, uh, he's, sorry, she's an advisor at the Norwegian Center for Conflict Resolution, Thank you, thank you, Esra. And first of all, thank you for having me on this panel, and thank you to the organizers for providing us with the space uh, to reflect upon the current bleak and unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza that has had a clear spillover effect across the Middle East and globally, but that has all also recentered the Palestine-Israel issue. I must admit that uh, it is somewhat difficult to discuss technical mechanisms and possible third-party roles in a post-agreement and negotiations phase when the drums of war are still beating with no ceasefire yet. Now, Norway's position has been clear on the need to focus diplomatic efforts on an immediate ceasefire as a key priority. But with that said, just as it is a global global responsibility to make that happen, it is also a global responsibility for the sake of international security to seriously work towards a political solution that does not only address the direct and physical violence we're seeing, but also the structural violence that has continued unabated because the so-called interim transitional phase post-Oslo was frozen in its transition for three decades among other factors. Today, uh, we hear talk of the establishment of interim governance, as well as other interim arrangements that might not only affect Gaza, but also the rest of the occupied territories, Israel, and the region. Now, especially due to the power asymmetry and distrust between the parties, these endeavors do demand cooperation and partnerships between dedicated third parties to ensure that an interim phase actually transitions into a final and sustainable uh, political settlement, ending the bloodshed and delivering justice while seeking to avoid the pitfalls of the past. Now regarding the guarantorship idea, which we are here today to discuss, 
It is important maybe to, to start by highlight, highlighting that there is no one agreed upon definition of guarantors in peace processes. There might also be a need to concretize whether the guarantorship framework is a framework for mediation or implementation or both. So these concepts can actually be understood differently. But with that said, what I will be focusing on as my expertise largely lies in Norwegian facilitation efforts is more generally how can third parties support diplomatic negotiations on Israel-Palestine. And I trust that my colleagues uh, here at the table might approach this issue from different and hopefully complementary angles. I would like to start by just making a few points reflecting upon some lessons Norway has learned from its experience as a guarantor country and some of its principles of engagement that could hopefully prove uh, useful for this discussion. The first point I want to make is that the source of a guarantor's mandate and potential effectiveness stems from the parties themselves. A key guiding principle in the Norwegian approach is that the parties themselves own the process and must assume overall responsibility of all phases and outcomes of any process, and that the third party role is a supportive rather than a coercive one, and it serves as a sort of an anchor or a backbone of any process. But at the same time, it must be said that the, this does not mean that the guarantor does not have influence and may not hold the parties accountable. In fact, as you all know, uh, guarantors are witnesses to agreements and have different tools at their disposal. For example, if agreements are breached, such as threatening, uh, if agreements are breached, they can threaten to publicly expose violations, to withdraw, among other soft tools. But ultimately, for sustainable settlements to work, parties need to see a self-interest in negotiations and implementation. And I believe that with regards to Israel-Palestine, the main challenge lies therein. What to do in a context when parties may seem uh, somewhat short-sighted and see in not reaching a settlement as in their self-interest. On the one hand, we have the narrative of the Israelis regarding their security concerns that may go as far as arguing for annexation and rejecting statehood for Palestinians. And on the other, we have the narrative of the Palestinian armed groups that proclaim the need for continued armed struggle to increase the cost of the siege and military occupation. And so what we see is that the current dynamics are inconducive and there truly is a need for engagement, particularly from the countries of the region that know the situation best and have a high stake in continued cycles of violence. The second point I want to make is that the guarantors, they play a vital role in laying the groundwork for any negotiations and addressing distrust between the parties and divergences also in terms of parties' capacities and needs. In the Colombian peace process with the former FARC guerrilla, a basic level of trust had to be established for the process to advance between the parties themselves, but also between the parties and the guarantor countries. The guarantors supported the party's decision to, for example, make unilateral concessions that helped build confidence in the process. Like, for example, when the FARC released hostages and ended the practice of kidnapping. The flexibility as well of the uh, guarantor country's mandate was also conducive for advancing the process, with Cuba and Norway holding a mandate that actually allowed included support to the parties in terms of capacity building, logistics, trust building, and other mediation tasks. And in this regard, particularly considering the asymmetrical power dynamic between Israelis and Palestinians, it is important for guarantors to be observant of the diverging needs and gaps that need to be filled. The third point uh, I want to refer to is regarding the setup of guarantor countries. Norway uh, has had a facilitator and a guarantor role in the peace processes in Colombia and currently participates as a guarantor country for the process with the ELN, National Liberation Army Guerrilla, together with Cuba, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Mexico, and Venezuela. Now, rather than having separate guarantors for each party in a conflict, it is often best to have one group with a shared understanding and responsibility. If guarantors are divided, then the risk of inter-guarantor disagreement forms an unnecessary burden on the talks. And in the context of the Middle East, as we all know, there has historically been an overlap between the regional Arab question and the Palestine question. And what we have learned is that both tracks are still interconnected and one should not overshadow the other. 
but ultimately for a sustainable solution that can have a, a tangible effect on the ground, it is clear that the national aspirations of the people on the ground are what need to be centered. And finally, uh, a quick point uh, on peacemaking and guarantorship strategies, specifically on Israel-Palestine. Third parties, I believe, guarantors or otherwise, should ensure that the security arrangements, which we'll hopefully speak more about, aren't one-sided and actually reflect the security needs of both peoples and their equal right to it, especially seen from a human security lens. I would also argue that right now, third parties have an important opportunity to center principles of international law and could play an important role in broadening the table, ensuring a diversity of perspectives that are represented, and this is something that we've all learned ultimately leads to more sustainable settlements. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on time, Chiara, and for this uh, very good introduction. Uh, next, we have Professor Alpaslan Özerdem, who is the Dean of the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution in Washington, D.C. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Algema, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think I want to tackle all the questions posed by Israel, and, um, and I want to tackle them in a more conceptual way. Uh, I will refer to Gaza case, and I think what I want to say is that it's going to be good uh, kind of um, continuation from Sierra's point. And Sierra thank you very much for bringing the ground here. That was really uh, helpful. So I think when it comes to uh, guarantorship and mediation, uh, the first thing we need to remember is that we are really talking about a context-specific uh, intervention. So um, in, I think, most cases, uh, pretty much uh, you know who would be the guarantor state or that, simply because of the nature of the conflict and the history uh, and uh, the, the actors. So for example, you couldn't even imagine uh, the um, uh, Good Friday Agreement uh, in Northern Ireland without uh, UK Ireland, uh, uh, some uh, engagement of the US and the EU, right? Um, you couldn't imagine the Cyprus conflict without Turkey, Greece, and the UK uh, for the colonial reasons. Um, Cambodia uh, it was pretty much uh, all the actors who took part in the conflict and their proxies for the regional and international were part of the multi-party mediation uh, process. And as uh, Kiera uh, described, Colombia, probably the latest one, uh, there is a, uh, the group of states under the leadership of Cuba and Norway, undertaking the roles of federalism uh, mediation. Right. So I think in that, um, I want to argue that uh, I think the, the challenges we are facing right now, especially uh, not only the post-9-11, but post-Arab Spring and even the contemporary world, we need to recognize two, uh, two uh, important issues in order to really uh, get the uh, better understanding of the challenges of guarantorship. The first one, I think, is the, uh, the fluidity of international politics right now. Uh, so probably in the past, it was much easier to sort of see who would be the guarantor states. But in many uh, conflicts that we face today, especially in the case of Gaza, uh, I don't think the picture is that clear. And, and, the, and in the contemporary cancel culture, uh, some guarantor states can easily be cancelled because of their engagement with the conflict and what's happening. So um, we are, I think, in a different time, so and I think it's important to, uh, to uh, recognize. Uh, the second point, I think, uh, which is quite different, um, and we need to recognize that uh, uniqueness, is that the complexity and the, and the, um, uh, the, the, the whole, you know, challenges of the contemporary peacemaking. And within that, you know, all these old peace processes are complex and uh, complicated, but protracted, intractable, and asymmetric conflicts are even more complicated and complex. And I think the Gaza-Palestine conflict is just one of those. Uh, this is not an easy uh, kind of like intervention, and I'm using the word easy with a kind of a, a, a tentative way here, but this, uh, the, the challenge we are facing here is particularly difficult. So I think all that in mind, I suggest that uh, probably similar to Colombia, but uh, more advanced way of constellations of roles and responsibilities should be the way forward for guarantorship. 
I don't think we should really think about states and decide the roles. We need to really decide what roles and responsibilities are needed and see and consider who should be the actors for this. I think we need to really change the way we are undertaking the whole guarantorship and mediation work. The old fashioned way of like the parties who are part of the conflict or intervene in third party uh, way uh, in the contemporary environment. I don't think that's going to work effectively. So what does that mean? Uh, I think although guarantorship and mediation tend to be used interchangeably, for me they are very different undertakings. So with the guarantorship, guarantor state or actor, um, the whole neutrality is a different thing. Probably with mediation work, yeah, I mean, you need to have the respect and the trust and the, and the, the kind of the legitimacy in the eyes of the parties. But as a guarantor, actor, you know, you are there because, especially in the asymmetric conflicts, as the identity of a protector. So you are there as a prefer, uh, pr uh, preferred uh, party of um, you know, one of the uh, sides in that conflict. So the whole issue of legitimacy neutrality, I think, is quite different. Um, and also, the, the roles of guarantorship, here I summarize this beautifully, it's not only about protection, it's not only about security, but it's also about underwriting the cost of post-conflict reconstruction underwriting the efforts of peace building and so much so that perhaps reconciliation, the long-term engagement. So here, what we are really talking about is different types of roles and responsibilities. And within that, um, constellations idea. And here, as the word constellation, I'm really talking about developing interaction, communication, and networks, both vertically and horizontally. That brings flexibility that here I was talking about. We need to have that flexibility, especially if you are engaging in these protracted uh, environments. Um, and you need to have shared responsibility. And the global governance at the moment, unfortunately, that's what's missing. And then I think constellation idea in guarantorship can bring a different way of responding to that. A divided way of, you know, sort of making guarantorship as a space for another, you know, sort of conflict is not the way forward to responding conflicts like Gaza. And the final, I think, advantage there is that such constellation idea would uh, kind of respond to the sharp ends of the real politic that you are likely to face in places like the Middle East conflict. Um, and the reason I'm proposing constellation idea is that in the peace and conflict um, uh, studies, uh, there are a number of um, you know, de well-developed um, uh, frameworks like the multi-track diplomacy, you know, whether it is the um, independent but uh, uh, undertaking uh, mediation uh, concurrently or the, uh, it's a unison uh, uh, uh, mediation by different actors or complex adaptive systems. Uh, theory. I think we really need to understand that you got to adapt your power actor agency relations in mediation and guarantorship. I think these binaries that we tend to create in such environments is not really helping some very complex uh, issues. We need to appreciate conflict transformation. It's not all about resolution. We are not chemists. We don't sell solution. We need to go and uh, you know, provide the opportunity for transformation for such conflicts. Guarantorship shouldn't be just about using leverage and the political military might. It should be about know-how with the conflict transformation. We need to recognize that. Which is about consensus building and power and uh, interest-based negotiation and, uh, and all that. So, the last uh, thing that I want to really mention is that those protracted conflicts we face to date are largely because of our failures of the past. They become an intractable conflict because we haven't really come up with innovative and creative ideas. Let's not forget that conflict resolution is, after all, coming up with the innovative solutions to old problems. So let's change our track with guarantorship and think about this creatively. Thank you.
Thank you, Ojam, also for being on time and raising some really uh, important uh, questions and issues about guarantorship. Next, uh, we are moving to uh, Hugh Slayton Swisher from the Swisher Empirical uh, Studies. And please come forward. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank and congratulate the organizers for continuing to nag the moral conscience of the world on the question of Palestine, and this is an important forum to, to get at these issues. I'm going to be a little bit less abstract and, and, and um, provide observations based on 20-plus um, years of covering America's role in mediating the Arab-Israeli conflict as a writer, author, journalist, um, and now as a, in private business. So. Um, the first thing I would start with is in, in discussing the challenges that third-party guarantors uh, face, the overall architecture of why you even have a guarantor, which is international law. And I agree with the UN Secretary General when he said that the repeated use by America of its veto to block any humanitarian ceasefire um, will spell the you know, final nail in the coffin of the United Nations itself. And these consequences, of course, will be untold, both for the organization and for the respect and adherence to international law, which was supposed to be a requirement for membership in the UN. The irony, of course, that it was the UN that gave birth to Israel in 1947 as one of its first official acts. Um, yet since the inception of the Oslo Accords in 1993, it's been the United States and Israel that have effectively marginalized the UN as a framework for reference in conflict resolution of this, this, uh, this matter. For the Netanyahu government, the United Nations is all but an enemy. It's essentially called UNRWA a terrorist organization. It systematically disparages many of the UN's most important components from the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council to UNESCO, and it ignores Security Council and UNGA resolutions, rejects the applicability of the Geneva Conventions, and it's called for the resignations of the Secretary General and the UNRWA chief. So, it's not very high on international law or the UN, and America has done very little to push back on that, and I would argue, especially under the presidency of Donald Trump, it's actually incited against the UN. I say this because the UN has an existing mandate to seek a solution for Palestine, and that model is trusteeship. And beneath that, there are third-party uh, third countries or coalitions that could act as security guarantors for a transitional period in Gaza the West Bank and East Jerusalem, as it had done in the case of East Timor. Today, if Israel, with U.S. complicity, were to again successfully sideline the U.N. from Palestine and destroy UNRWA, it may well be the death knell of both organizations and the latter's role in guaranteeing international law. Now, I note this is something that Turkey and President Erdogan have consistently raised. Uh, the president even wrote a book about it. Um, and I suppose it's good that the Secretary General Gutierrez is now alive to this situation. It's better, better late than never. My second observation is that October 7th um, came about not just because of America's failed monopolization and mediation of the issue, but also because of recent decades in providing one-sided security guarantees to Israel. And I'm not just talking about the billions in aid and weapons it provides to Israel annually. Recall after the 9-11 attacks, when the United States was trying to min minimally satisfy the world on the issue of Palestine so that I could pursue a war in Iraq. It launched this 2002 Roadmap for Peace, which was supposed to see the creation of a Palestinian state by 2005. Bush, President Bush, urged Palestinians to elect leaders uncompromised by terror, move towards democracy, and negotiate with Israel. In the meantime, he appointed a security coordinator, General Keith Dayton, and a slew of envoys after him. as. Uh, charged with the mission to assemble and train an army of Palestinian recruits so they could guarantee security for the forthcoming non-militarized Palestinian state. This was in addition to EU funding for the training of police and covert assistance by the CIA to professionalize an array of Palestinian internal uh, security and intelligence services. These collective, U these collective U.S. trained security forces essentially became subcontractors for Israel working to please America under its fictional aim of preparing for imminent statehood. With funding from the State Department, these Israeli vetted personnel were mostly trained by American military contractors. At its best, these Dayton battalions um, provided crowd control functions in areas A and B, or uh, you know, at its worst, as we revealed when I was at Al Jazeera, 
they were used to torture and intimidate political rivals of President Abbas. So essentially, the U.S. helped create a Palestinian version of Blackwater. And in the backdrop to all this was, the, of course, the never-to-come push for a, a Palestinian state um, under the banner that they must democratize first. Now, I was in Palestine in 2005 as an elections monitor under the umbrella of the Carter uh, Center, and I can say, as everyone did, that it was a free and fair election. It was just that Washington didn't like the outcome. Um, as such, the U.S., along with Fatah's Gaza security chief, Mohammed Dahlan, and some plotting neighboring Arab states, uh, had a coup to oust the Hamas leadership, which the group learned about and preempted. When Palestinians fought amongst themselves, the United States threw up their hands uh, as if they were innocent bystanders. 2005 came and went. Uh, no, no Palestinian state was formed, and the issue was kicked into the long grass. But the American security training mission continued. This brings me to my, my point of what's being discussed as guarantorship um, in the current context. Much of the discussion on getting humanitarian ceasefire before Ramadan on March 10th, in the first phase of 45 days, the focus is said to be on exchange of hostages, one Israeli per day for 45 days, and a pause in fighting so humanitarian aid can get inside. Beyond that, there would most likely be a PA civilian administrator backed by Hamas to tend to civilian and humanitarian aspects inside the Strip. With Saudi backing, Mahmoud Abbas is promoting Mohammed Mustafa for that role, a move Abbas hopes will keep him relevant. Furthermore, although Gaza security chief, former Gaza security chief Mohammed Dahlan claims he has no desire to return to power in Gaza, along with the UAE, he's said to be promoting Nasser Kidwa for the Palestinian civilian caretaker role in Gaza. The Emirates uh, is also being considered as a security guarantor alongside uh, the UAE and Jordan. Um, but here I think it's worth pointing out that they might have their own devious objective um, and we could see what happened uh, along the lines of the Yemen model. For example, we could witness the security guarantor mission used as cover for action by certain Arab intelligence services to report to Tel Aviv on the activities and infrastructure of Palestinian armed resistance and its leadership. Once deployed inside Gaza throughout the long and slow reconstruction period, they could attempt to quietly neutralize Hamas through expulsions and executions. This would fit into the UAE's larger um, campaign against the Muslim Brotherhood and its affiliates worldwide, and it has echoes of what Dahlan attempted to do in 2000s and what the UAE did against President Morsi in Egypt following the Arab Spring. Last minute. Wow. Okay, so... Um, we should consider what... We should consider what will happen uh, should diplomacy fail following the first phase of the ceasefire. There would likely be a view that the Arabs are there working for Israel. There'd be Arab on Arab bloodshed. That fighting, of course, would benefit Netanyahu. He'd throw up his hands in the air and say, look, they're fighting amongst themselves. How can they make peace? Um, I'm going to conclude with um, kind of what I started with, which is we need to bring back the UN as a central player. And then I'm going to propose that we utilize NATO for security guarantees. America can't go alone. It's captured by domestic pro-Israel politics in an election year. And this is the time for the UN uh, to be back at the front and center of this. And it can deploy UN peacekeeping forces, possibly reinforced by a NATO contingent. And I'd say it's not as crazy as it sounds. Back in 2010, the Obama administration, uh, through General Jones, actually suggested deploying NATO in the West Bank as part of a multinational force um, to see Israeli settlers evacuated and to provide uh, security for all parties, not just um, the Israelis. Um, I would say it's a good I, I, it was a good idea then and it's a good idea now. As a NATO member, Turkey should consider reviving discussions over NATO forces to guarantee security for both Israelis and Palestinians. It has its own experience in the West Bank and its observer mission toward the temporary international presence in Hebron. And um, I think Turkey, with NATO countries deployed both inside the West Bank and along the external borders of Gaza, could ensure humanitarian aid and materials get inside. Turkey would certainly be a more trusted uh, third-party uh, country uh, inside the Gaza Strip. And, um, you know, Turkey could certainly advance this with NATO, uh, uh, in, inside the NATO framework, but also uh, amongst the countries of the global south, 
BRICS countries and other Islamic countries. Um, can you wrap yeah, up? I'll, I'll, I'll, I'll finish there and we can <laughs> save the rest uh, for Sorry the Sorry for being very blunt. But no. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and I'm, I apologize. I know you have a lot, all of you have a lot to say, but we have a, you know, we have eight speakers and, and we have to be on time. Uh, and next uh, we have Ali Berge, uh, Dr. Ali Berge, who is a senior associate at Mani Africa Media and Research Services. Uh, well, thank you, Ezra, and thank you to all my panelists, and thank you to all of you for participating in this uh, important conversation. Uh, let me preface my remarks by saying I'm not a specialist or a scholar of the Middle East. I um, draw from a hopefully wider global experience, and I hope that's uh, different but also complementary to uh, my fellow speakers. I'd like to make five points in my time. The first is that, like all international interventions or engagements, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to guarantorship either. There might be some things that seem sensible to adapt from elsewhere, but unless an approach is contextually nuanced, flexible, uh, willing to change and be adaptable to circumstance, guarantorship can be as unwieldy as any other form of international intervention. The second point I'd like to make is with respect to what I see as the deficiency or the insufficiency of the usual practice. Now, we can all think about uh, agreements that have been reached in a number of places that when conflicts come to a negotiated end, there's that section at the end which has that little bit talking about monitoring, about guar guarantors. And it's usually very vaguely laid out. Monitoring is usually very la vaguely laid out, and guarantorship is often symbolically laid out. It's not even uh, specific at all about what that means. And I don't think that's necessarily only a question of uh, what parties to conflicts want. I think it's also a failure or a lack of imagination to go beyond what is usually done. So that brings me to the, the third point I'd like to raise, which is, well then, what is the alternative? Can we move beyond this very sort of template arrangement, keeping in mind what I said initially, that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach? The theory, of course, is that adopting or accepting more rigorous monitoring on the part of the parties is both a sign of commitment, but also that it makes it more difficult for parties to uh, renege, to defect from their role. Um, and I mentioned monitoring rather than guarantorship at this point because while they both invoke this third party role, in practice they're very much overlapping. How can you guarantee an agreement if you aren't following it very closely and monitoring it? So even if the requirements might be very different in terms of uh, neutrality or buy-in, in some respects uh, there is a lot of complementarity. But also, uh, critically, in terms of uh, the world we live in, the actors are often the same. So whether we have an ideal type of uh, what uh, guarantorship should look like, the fact is we're dealing with imperfect actors. So when we talk about can it be different, can it move beyond, uh, one question is, is there a role to think about this more robustly? And I would say, and I make this my fourth point, to say that often the opportunities for making monitoring and guarantorship more robust are missed. And while the symbolic role is important, I'm not suggesting it isn't, uh, there is often uh, a next step which needs to be taken. So here I'd like to bring in an example that might seem uh, rather distant, but nonetheless, I think it's relevant still, uh, which is Kosovo in 1998. So I'm talking about before the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. What's forgotten is that the largest, or the then largest ever regional monitoring mission, which was called the Kosovo Verification Mission, was deployed through the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, as a result of a personal agreement between uh, US envoy Richard Holbrooke and uh, President of Yugoslavia, Slobodan Milosevic. Nearly 1,400 monitors, or as they were called in that context, verifiers, were deployed. But they lacked a clear strategy for deterring further violence. They were much more focused on their own internal institutional issues. And ultimately, they had very little influence over the parties. And they were withdrawn so that the bombing of Yugoslavia could start. So I choose this example to show it as a case of monitoring preceding war rather than following it, and just how 
um, difficult and how counterproductive poor monitoring for guarantorship can be. So to conclude, what to focus on then instead? And I'll make this my rather large fifth point with a few sub bits. I suggest the following tasks and strategies for actors playing these roles. The first is that mandates, and this comes back to what Chiara said initially, that mandates need to be much more well thought out. That might mean making them much more elaborate, not only thematically, not only in scope, but also critically, temporally. So what I mean by this here is that it's not enough just to say that guarantors, monitors oversee the agreement, whatever the agreement might be, but thinking about how those tasks and duties might look in one or two or three years' time, when we know by nature of these protracted, difficult conflicts uh, that things become difficult. What are the milestones? What are the responsibilities at that stage? Guarantorship often takes its eyes off the road, especially after the initial uh, critical um, signing and uh, takeoff period starts. So here I'd like to mention the example of the Assessment and Evaluation Commission in Sudan, where the six-year implementation period for that peace agreement uh, basically did stall in the middle, and they did have this opportunity because written into the agreement was this mid-term report, this three-year marker where they could kind of redeem themselves and bring things back. And even though that agreement faced many challenges, the fact that it had that temporal dimension was very important. The second thing that I think guarantors and monitors can think about more specifically, and of course the parties to those negotiations, are what might be the mechanisms for breaking deadlocks, making tough decisions. Northern Ireland has already been mentioned. Um, we have, uh, of course, the more contemporary examples. But whichever case we're talking about, we're talking about distrustful parties, implementation is difficult, sometimes there's low implementation capacity, decisions often stall. Implementation is itself an arena for renegotiation. So talking about implementation as if it's somehow completely separate from negotiation is perhaps artificial. And in the sense of having that opportunity or, again, anticipating that there will be difficult moments, that even the parties that have the best will in the world to implement an agreement will face difficulties. How do you overcome those deadlocks? And here, again, there might be a more successful example to draw from Northern Ireland. Turning to security arrangements, one other idea uh, to put forward here is that while, again, guarantors and monitors have these roles in overseeing uh, security arrangements, and agreements often have these grand designs for security reforms, for implementation, guarantorship, when it comes to security, is often about the more coercive practices cutting off aid or training, reducing particular kinds of assistance, or else hoping for the best and security sector reform and all of the accompanying things will just go well because we've laid out this template. I don't think there are that many good examples of this, but in a way, what I suggest is much more thinking about scenarios with the parties. This is where it becomes more collaborative exercise to say, well, okay, what if our reform of this element of the security space doesn't go according to plan? Then what? anticipating rather than simply reacting. And the last point I make is that all too often confidence building, because after all, this is what's key to implementation and key to any effective role of third parties, is seen as something of an elite matter. It's an elite question. And there's very little thinking about what this might mean locally at a um, more community or even subnational level. Since guarantors tend to be big states, they tend to be states, big institutions, they lack this local context, they lack this local nuance. And so there's much more opportunity here to think about both a more vertically, vertically integrated approach, but also one that draws in other kinds of third parties and not simply uh, state actors and big institutions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ali, and also finishing on time. I appreciate that. And uh, a lot of good examples and also not so good examples, but you gave us a lot of food for thought. Um, next, uh, we have Ambassador Hisham Yusuf, uh, and 
He is a senior advisor at the United States Institute of Peace. Thank you very much, Professor Esser. Uh, I'll be talking about four points. The first point about the role of third parties in uh, security guarantees. The second is about what the third parties should be focusing on. The third on best practices. And finally, challenges that are facing uh, security arrangements. In relation to the assessment, uh, I think I'd, I would agree with Kiera when she said the, the main issue rests with the parties concerned. If the agreement reached is fair, just, and something that the parties can live with, it will survive and become sustainable. If we look in our part of the world, in the Middle East, if you look at the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty, the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty, and more recently, the Israel-Lebanese agreement on maritime demarcation, then we see that when the parties are satisfied with what was reached, then it becomes more sustainable. Uh, the Arab League, for example, also guaranteed the Doha Agreement about the situation in Lebanon, and it was also sustainable because the parties were satisfied with the balance of agreement that was reached. But when, to ga when we come to Gaza, that's a totally different ballgame. Uh, what we have seen since Hamas uh, took control of Gaza in 2007 is that we have had four or five wars, depending on how you count them. Only one ended with a Security Council resolution, which is the war that took place in 2008, 2009, and it was Resolution 1860. The rest ended through ceasefires that were mainly brokered by Egypt and Qatar with the help of the United States. But it was always clear that this is only temporary until the next war. It was firefighting diplomacy, and firefighting diplomacy does not work. Even Israel called it mowing the law, meaning that it will come again to have another war. And I think that the only guarantee for security in as far as this issue is concerned is through ending occupation and the establishment of a Palestinian state. As to what third parties should be focusing on, I think what they should be focusing on is very clear, to reach an agreement that the parties can live with. And when we have a situation that we see in Gaza today, where a large number of Western powers are not even willing to say the word ceasefire, then we know how difficult this situation is and the kind of trouble that we are in, in addressing this conflict. And my difficulty more broadly in, in, this, in the region is that it seems that there is an effort to transform the conflicts in the region into low-intensity conflicts so that they don't bother the rest of the world, but not to resolve them. And we see this uh, situation in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, and in other places around the region. And for in Syria, for example, it was easier to admit that the regime has succeeded rather than to put the political effort necessary to address the situation. And of course, the question of double standards. On all kinds of issues that we have been witnessing, and we can go into detail if we have time, but if not, then I think this is, has become obvious this time around more than in any previous wars. As to best practices, the, you know, the picture is, you know, somewhat gloomy, but there has been success wars. There have been failures, as we have seen in Rwanda and in, in Bosnia, but there has be also been successes. One of the biggest successes have been the multinational forces in Sinai and Israel in relation to the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. Uh, there has been others, and my colleagues have mentioned some success stories in uh, Colombia and with IA uh, in, in, and so on. So there are success stories as well that we can build on in uh, security guarantees. As a matter of fact, UNIFIL 
uh, despite all its shortcomings, have also been successful in maintaining uh, peace in, in this situation, although now it has become precarious for other reasons rather than for uh, their performance uh, alone. Uh, finally, in relation to the challenges, and the challenges are huge. And I think one of the biggest challenges is structure, which is the situation that we witness in the Security Council. And as Clayton mentioned, the repeated use of the veto is not the right approach to advance the prospects of peace. And we have been seeing intra rather than, in, uh, than interstate conflicts. And this is also having an impact. And the symmetry that was also mentioned before, and the role of non-state armed groups. And now they are using quite advanced weaponry. Look at what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea. It is showing havoc to global trade. So these are some of the difficulties that we're facing, and we have to see how to deal with them in a more uh, consistent way. But then Ali also spoke about, about mandates. Mandates are also crucial uh, because uh, as a result of sometimes loose mandates, the situation becomes worse. But this also relies on the kind of agreements that are reached because sometimes the agreements that are reached are uh, not solid enough to allow the situation to be stable. Finally, in relation to uh, some of the challenges that are may be specific, and I think uh, this was uh, mentioned somewhat by, by Clayton as well. When you have the wrong objective, and this is the situation in Gaza today, when you say we want uh, either regional or international forces, that would help complete the, the Israeli mission, rather than think in a way that would achieve security both to Palestinians and to Israelis. And as long as this is the type of thinking that is behind how the situation is dealt with, then you will never achieve success. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Yusuf. Um, next, we have um, Professor uh, Hussein Shiksal, who is the special advisor to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, um, president on international relations and diplomacy. Thank you, Esra, dear distinguished guests. I believe that the Palestinian issue will be dead and buried only uh, when men stop talking about it. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, thank, thank you uh, for inviting me here and express my uh, views uh, on, uh, in Ankara Diplomacy Forum, a very prestigious platform under the auspices of Shlesa of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and absolutely excellent organization of uh, Prime Minister of Turkey. So, um, I am the special advisor of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus President, but here I am addressing you as a professor of international relations, so my views not necessarily reflect uh, the view of my country. So in the next three hours, I will try to set the scene uh, for the why there is a guarantee for them in, in the region, in Palestine, and if I have time, I, I want to give some my thoughts about the assets and the limits, challenges of a guarantor in, in the region. So, since October 8th, we are witnessing, like a reality show, a human tragedy in Palestine. To that toll exceeds 30,000 the number of immigrants which the Sunni Because I want to talk about the details, I want to talk about the facts, you know, we are not talking about illusions here. 70% uh, of the victims are children and women, and the long-lasting lives of the Palestinians is not a recent phenomenon. Some people still think that it started with the attack of Hamas to the Israel. It's not. We are talking about three different forms of violence in the region. One is unfortunately repeated and systematic attacks of Israel in Gaza. The second one is violence by the Israeli settlers. And the third one is 
structural e, violence that şiddet, escalated, e, especially after 67 war, and it's not only related with the Israeli Palestinians, it also covers all the regional actors. And again, let's talk about the facts. Since the UN partition plan of Palestine in 1948, there have been four major wars in the region. 1948, 56, Suez Canal War, 67, Six Days War, and 73, Yom Kippur War. Plus, there is at least four other big scale war, War of Attrition, Operation Litani, 78, uh, Occupation of South Lebanon, 85, and again, South Lib uh, 82, and South Lebanon Conflict, 85, Plus, at least we got three or four major wars in Gaza itself. As you know, in 2008, 2009, 2014, and now 2023. So all this empirical evidence show us that we need a guarantorship model in the region because unfortunately violence become a modus operandi in the region. We have to see and accept this fact. So as long as this conflict continue, there will be vicious circle of violence. And as perfectly stated by Prime Minister Hakan Fidan, there is only two ways. Either there will be greater war or there will be greater peace. So in that issue, I want to make some observations. First of all, if the Palestinians lost their homes in Gaza, unfortunately, history shows us in a dramatic way that they will never get a chance to turn back. Secondly, when we look at the Israeli attacks, there is no way that these war crimes against the civilians has to be justified, and it has to come to an end immediately. My third point is there is a continuous effort to downgrade the state of Palestine. When we look at the state of Palestine, it's recognized as a full state by the 139 members of the United Nations. State of Palestine is a full member in the Arab League, full member of Organization of Islamic Cooperation, full member of G77, full member of International Olympic Committee, full member of FIFA, FIBA, UNESCO, so forth, so on. So we are talking about a state, but I think that there's a real intention to downgrade the Palestinian state, because if you downgrade the Palestinian state, then you also downgrade its capacity legal capacity to sign any treaty according to international law. And my other point is that not only the Palestinians, but also the people of Israel will never feel secure without a guarantorship model. The Israel economic activities and anti-Israeli sentiment is on rise, and this is all around the world. It's not only limited, you know, with the uh, people living in the Israel. And people in Israel, a silent majority, is also have a deep concern about the secularity and the democracy of the country, because they knew that this vicious cycle of violence will also make the state of Israel more fundamental as far as you keep this justification on the table. So all this way show us that the two-state solution is the only way, only way forward for Palestine. And this is already declared in the Declaration of Venice, Berlin Declaration, Sevilla Declaration of European Union, Security Council resolutions, there are many, 2042, 338, 1397, so far, so on. So in that way forward, Turkey make a very important constructive way forward. It's called Turkish model, but the thing is, as far as I understood, Turkey is not saying that 
you know, I want to declare. Turkey is saying that this human tragedy should be stopped. And whoever stopped this, very well welcome. Okay, so let me, in, in my time is limited, but let me tell you a few details. First of all, in my opinion, there must be multiple guarantors, at least few for Palestine, one or few for Israel. Palestinian guarantors should be from the region, definitely. The role of guarantors should be pave the way for two-state solution. And at the current stalemate, the first thing we should do is there should be a conference to just stop the violence, immediate conference, and then we can discuss the two-state solution. So ineffectiveness and failures of the United Nations is showing us that Unfortunately, none of the UN peacekeeping forces could stop the violence in Palestine. So we have to think about sui generis, brand new models, if you want a real sustainable security in the region. And my final comment is that, what should be the role of the guarantor? I think it shouldn't be only limited to the security. As in the case of defunct state of 1960 Republic of Cyprus, the Treaty of Guarantor powers maybe should ensure not only security, but also maintenance of the independence, territorial integrity, and security of the Republic. So as I said, if I have the second round, I want to talk about a few more details about the law of security. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our next uh, speaker is uh, Salman Sheikh, uh, founder and CEO of the Sheikh Group, based in the UK. Thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure to be here for the first time in Antalya and at this forum. Um, um, I'm inevitably going second last, so I'm probably going to cover quite a bit of the, the, the journey that's already been traveled in this excellent panel, and I want to thank everyone else um, for their comments. I, I will try to combine the concept of guaranteeship with trusteeship. UN trusteeship, something I think that Clayton uh, was also um, highlighting. Before I do that, let me say very clearly that today we face a very deep crisis of legitimacy and credibility when it comes to the whole Arab-Israeli conflict. It is a depth which I don't think any of us have ever experienced in our lifetimes. And I have worked on this issue for the last 25 years. In fact, I looked at a picture the other day my house when I lived in Gaza is now just sand along the beach road. So we have to acknowledge that there is a before and, and now. And both the before and now have not achieved the results we would like as PRSA. Um, UN resolutions have not been implemented. There is a, a deep skepticism, and not least amongst the Palestinian people, but also amongst the Israelis. So how do we overcome that? Well, let me just say before I get into that, there is a UN historical role. Um, we've already heard it, whether it's Cambodia, Somalia, Bosnia, Eastern Slavonia, Kosovo, and East Timor. I'll come back to East Timor like Clayton did um, as well in a minute. Before we go further, though, we do need some elements in place. We need a ceasefire. I believe we need an international conference that will set us um, after that ceasefire. Uh, towards uh, a more international effort. We need clear UN mandates and we need a, a guarantee group of what I would call an international contact group for Israel and Palestine. Um, in terms of the UN mandates, it's high time that the international community does um, get behind and pass a resolution on a Palestinian state. If you look at it, four members of, of the Permanent Member Security Council probably would support that. Um, uh, the question is the United States. Um, and then we have, of course, the Arab League, uh, a plethora of other international bodies, uh, the OIC and others who have already said that. Um, secondly, a transitional, and this is what I would like to propose, a transitional international trustee regime for Gaza with a mandate to lay the groundwork for an independent Palestinian state. That should be our goal. The goal should be to 
in the end help Palestinians to achieve self-determination, self-government, which is based on a clear political horizon. Um, why do I propose prestige at this point in time? Again, a lot of that has been covered. Um, by translating. Um, and here we're talking about Gaza specifically. Um, Israel as the occupying power um, has clearly shown that it doesn't have the legitimacy to govern. And in fact, some of its plans right now, and it can get worse, um, means um, that we have to look to other alternatives. The Palestinian Authority, a revitalized Palestinian Authority, of course, um, and Palestinians more generally should assume that role. But I believe that we need a period of time whereby which Palestinians are able to build their unity and build the apparatus that can be effective in Gaza, as well as um, across uh, the, the Palestinian, occupied Palestinian territory. Simply right now, I would say the Palestinian Authority doesn't have the legitimacy, the capacity or the resources. Um, and so let me go to uh, the international prestige idea. Um, we need a move towards Palestinian statehood, which is a time-bound, irreversible path to Palestinian statehood. We need a structured transition to self-rule, which, which integrates Palestinian uh, governance, Palestinian authority in decision making. Um, the UN, as I've said, has previous experience um, in this, historical and recent. I've said the more recent one, but historically, specifically related to this crisis. It was Harry Truman in 1947 that actually proposed an international regime for Jerusalem at that time, which would last 10 years. It was Ralph Bunch in the Armistice Agreement in 1948 who suggested uh, the role for UN forces and, uh, and UNSO was created. So we do have a precedent even there for both uh, a, a, a, a, a UN role as well as the prestige. Um, let me come to East Timor. Now I was one of those fortunate people to know Sergio Vieira de Mello. Um, uh, I, in fact, wrote uh, with his team the last address he made to the UN Security Council before he went back uh, to Iraq and, and was tragically killed with some of my other colleagues uh, there at the time. Now, Sergio was brilliant. He understood that we needed a, um, after a 20 odd years of military rule, we needed a way out when it came to East Timor. And so we, he had the mandate which established UNTE uh, in 1999, and he knew that it needed to be time bound. So within three years, we had a referendum and we had the creation of East Timor. Um, there. Now, UNTE was unprecedented in terms of the role it took because there was a direct UN rule of, uh, over a certain territory. It was backed up by a UN Security Council resolution under Chapter 7. It, it, there, as we know, there was a, uh, a, a security force led by Australia, which had enforcement power um, at the time, uh, Intrapet, and of course, in addition to restoring security, it was there to establish the administration, bringing aid and working with the abolition forces um, and development. I put this up as as much to be provocative, but this is probably what Gaza needs as well today. Um, Last minute. Yes. In terms of my own uh, experience, I would propose two things in related to that when it comes to Gaza. I worked for the United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process in 2000, the start of the Second Intifada. Um, in fact, that office was set up in 1994, post-Oslo, for a transition process. It was supposed to strengthen UN interagency uh, response and help the Palestinian people and their needs. There was supposed to be financial, technical assistance, and uh, it was supposed to be representative to the UN Secretary General in terms of the peace process. I believe that office can be revitalized in more 
e, acaba etkin bir garantörlük sistemi ne olabilir diye düşünmemiz gerekiyor. Herhangi bir barış olursa bölgede bunun nasıl bir garantör <gülüyor> sahip olabilir? Çünkü bir sorun var ama ne olacak değil mi? Uluslararası bir anlaşma yok. Garantörlüğünü şu an için tanımlayan. Evet, gerçekten bence bu bir şey gerektiğini söylediğim gibi. Özellikle mevcut But of course there are a lot of international scholars trying to define this for many centuries actually. We know that guarantorship means some safe kind of safeguards if there are things which are already agreed. This definition is a bit short to cover all the contracts in the sense that sometimes guarantorship is needed for a process of settlement of terms. Çözüm sürecini de içermeyelim. Bu sadece korumakla kalmamalı. Aynı zaman taraflara yakınında bulunup ve işte mesela bir barış sürecinin gerçekleştirilmesi ve bir barışın inşaatı içinde ne yaptığını bulmak istemeli. Yani ilk aşamada gördüğümüz olan şey siz yani siz bu konuda bir süreci ihtiyacımız var. Hala ateşlikten bahsediyoruz. Ve 30 binden fazla sivil hayatını kaybettik. Ama biz hala ateşkese ihtiyacımız var mı yoksa bundan bahsediyoruz. Ya da işte kim zorlayacak İsrail'i yani bu saldırıları sonlandırmaya ve bunun bundan bahsediyoruz. Bu nedenle bence garantörlük oldukça acil bir ihtiyaç. Yani yakın zamanda olması gerekiyor bu Filistin'e ilgili olarak. Çünkü possibility of catastrophe concerning the city of Rafah. Although international court of justice has quite recently, just one week ago, said that the Palestinian state of Israel is under threat of war. Although international court of justice has quite recently, just one week ago, said that the protective measures decided by the court is covering any kind of attack on Rafah because these measures are preventing Israel from any kind of attack on civilians. İsrail'in şeyleri İsrail saldırılarından soruyor ama biz ben bunu İsrail'in diye alacağını sanmıyorum. O yüzden garantörlük bu noktada başlamalı diye düşünüyorum. Tabii ki birçok sorunlar var yani etkili bir garantörlükle ilgili olarak bölgede. Yani uluslararası hukuk bilim insanları peki etkili bir garantörlük nasıl olur bunu tamamlamaya çalışıyorum. Ne tür unsurları içermeli? Yani işte eğer etkili bir garantörlükten bahsediyorsak ve her şey soracak olursanız bir güç dengesi ile ilgili yani garantörler arasında ya bu tarafların garantörler arasında bir güç dengesi olması da olması da çözülüyor her şey ve son gözlem olarak yani İsrail durumuna baktığımız zaman mesela garantörlük ile ilgili olarak acaba yani mesela kim acaba İsrail'i bir barış sürecine zorlayabilir ve işte oluşan bir barış anlaşmasına ve tabii ki yani belki Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nin bazı batı ülkeleri çünkü farklı bir seçenek yok mesela işte güç dengesi ile ilgili olarak etkili ve garantörlük için bölgede ve bence We should be thinking a bit wider in the sense that in the past, international law scholars have always emphasized that for an effective guarantorship, there should be a strong basis of evidence. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people should be protected. Because there are many reasons why the Palestinian people or any kind of peace agreement, using not only the military elements, but also other elements. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the situation why the Palestinians are not able to protect themselves. So that may be the olması için e, yeterli olmadığını göz önüne alarak ya buradaki siyasi ve en zamanda ticari ve ekonomik bazı unsurlarda dikkate alınmalı. Çok teşekkür ediyorum zamana riayet ettiğiniz için hocam. Before I turn to the audience, as you have also observed, there's some areas of agreement among our speakers, such as you know some of the ones that I noted. Uh, mandates should not be vague. There are definitely some good examples uh, 
regionally or at the country level in the absence of an international agreement. Uh, maybe we should look at these successful examples on lessons learned, such as East Timor, Kosovo, Sudan, Cambodia, Colombia, Egypt, Israel agreements. These are some of the ones that I noted down and several others were also mentioned. Another um, point of agreement among our um, speakers is that a coercive military approach alone is not going to be enough. And it should be, the idea of guarantorship should be, um, you know, supported, bolstered, or we should have a broader approach, thinking about peace building tools or conflict transformation tools, um, etc. There are also some disagreements, as you have heard, among our speakers, too, especially with regards to the role of the UN, the effective role uh, or how effective it can be, uh, given the history of the conflict. Especially with regard to the UN peacekeeping, uh, we have different conflicting views, as you have heard. Um, at this point, um, I would like to, so we have about 15 minutes left until the end of the round table. I would like to turn to the audience and uh, get a couple of questions, and then we'll turn to our uh, speakers, our panelists again, to make their final remarks. So I see Akhtojan, you, yes, let's start. So let's take a couple of questions, maybe four or five questions. And please try to be brief in your questions, <laughs> rather than giving another eight minute talk. Uh, please try to be brief in your questions, and then we'll turn, so that we have time to turn to our panelists for one last time. Yes. Thank you, organizers of this uh, my question is, I've seen enough uh, in several decades regarding this Palestinian issue. Uh, my question is, one of the notions, I'm an architectural professor of international relations. Um, motion of R2P didn't work in place of Gaza. There was 800 people killed in Libya. It automatically involved the leadership of Sarkozy, the then president of France, just took some law. My question is, all of the presenters believe and assume, and we also support this idea that the first is but if it is accepted by an international community and primarily with the support of the United States, in all of those cases that these models work, the United States was tardy to this process. In this case, it is not. My question is, and we could, and, uh, someone would answer to this question, <coughs> there is no willingness on the part of Israel and the United States to come to the table in order to solve this. And the rest of the international community is very much disinterested in this, including Arabs, communities, and Muslims. So the question is, how would you create that so that all of these models that we discussed would one day, inshallah, well. uh, uh, I saw another hand here. Yes, please. Please introduce yourselves and ask your question. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. I get a message. We have to ask uh, very directly. Uh, thank you so much. We get a lot of information about how can we go ahead to solution ongoing problems in the conflict. However, I hope that everybody is agree that the United Nations is now working perfectly. My question is to the professor in As you mentioned that the Article 33 bringing to us peaceful solution about the ongoing and peaceful without the use of force, uh, Even though everybody signed up uh, this important article, how can we go ahead on going to possible uh, solution on One is Russia, Ukraine, and another is Gaza. Thank you so much. Uh, we can take two more questions. Yes, please.
Thank you very much. Issa Kassis, Mayor of Ramallah, Palestine. It's not a question, it's a remark I would like to add into the equation about the capacity that the PA has built through the years. One major thing that drove me here is the role of local governments, democratically elected local governments who are capable to go beyond classic vanilla products that any local government provides, getting into all the 17 SDGs and doing them with excellence. I believe we have a model in Ramallah and in the coming few days, I'll be discussing this um, enough. And I believe this is something that we can plug into the equation that might think that might change the thinking paradigm about about the Palestinian issue and how uh, the day after would look like once democratically elected the state of Palestine will be established. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn the time in Turkey. Arkamıda bakıyorum acaba bir ona affedilmek mi var? Buyurun lütfen. Thank you so much for the first Teşekkürler. question. Uh, my name is Yahya. Uh, I'm an Yahya. international student, international Uluslar relations student. Uh, my question is to Mr. Şey Stitcher. Uh, and if I may quote, you said the conflicts of today is the conflicts of today are a reflect of the failure of the past. But at the same time, uh, as a conclusion, you said that we should bring back the UN as a central player in this conflict. So, as a failure of 70 years in bringing the solution for this conflict, and as the honorable professor has said that Israel and the United States, they don't have the will to solve the situation in a peaceful way. So what is your perspective in the UN to solve this conflict in a diplomatic time? All right, let's take one more question. I think we have time and then we'll turn to our panels. Yes, please. There. Yes. Thank you so much. My name is Ergo Sturk. I'm an associate professor of politics from London Metropolitan University. My question is to Professor Rezerdan. He mentioned about the innovative approaches of the guarantorship and the peace building. I mean, uh, we've been all talking about the agreements and the other practical issues, but I think, Professor Rezerdan, do you think being a beneficial smart father is a way to be a guarantor, because what I believe, okay, being a member of NATO, very being an influential actor in international relations is fine, but at the same time, what I believe, culture, religion, historical background, so on and so forth, the other normative issues could play a not only a supportive role, but at the same time, their benefits as the vertical and the horizontal line could be very helpful to be a guarantorship, because what we know from many different examples, uh, being an outsider, if you have a strong hard power, like visibility in international relations is fine, but being an outsider makes you a stranger for the region and for the dynamics of the people, because, okay, we've been always talking about the countries, but we need to consider the individuals, which are the main components, main elements of the countries and international relations. So in this regard, what do you think being a useful, smart power and the role of the guarantorship or the mediator, or it's an old fashioned and or it's not enough to be an innovative in this global contemporary age. Thank you so much. Thank you. So at this point, I would like to turn uh, back to our panelists and this time start from the reverse order. Um, please respond to the questions and also make your, you know, if you would like to uh, make some final remarks, also mention them, not exceeding two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a question for me. Uh, 
uh, about uh, Article 30, 33 of the United Nations Charter. Uh, actually, this article talks about the peaceful means of settlement of any kind of international dispute. Of course, as I have to say again, that there is a wonderful principle again in Article 33 of the United Nations Charter, but how to enforce the states to use the peaceful means. Let me give uh, this, the, this Palestinian-Israel situation as a as striking example. I think in my perception as an international scholar, just one day after the 7th of October, Israeli acts on Israel were without legal basis. You know, Israel kept saying that it was using its right to self-defense. We know the limits of self-defense in international law. It just exceeded in the second day the level of self-defense. So Israel has been trying to settle the issue, according to itself, by using violence. Although it's clearly prohibited uh, by Article uh, 33 of the United Nations Charter. So it's, it's again down to the guarantorship and uh, uh, Mesut Aja says uh, we should include some other states uh, for a guarantee system because it's not only about using violence or military power. So that's why I'm not, I'm completely against the involvement of uh, NATO, for example, in the region or United Nations as a, only a political tool. We should find another kind of means of establishing a guarantorship, not only in including the military, maybe not including the military interference in the region, but rather uh, other elements like political, commercial, or some other elements. We know that Israel have not been able to carry out such a long term of military attacks on Gaza if there were no economic and military aid from outside, uh, from other side. So that's why we should uh, try to establish a bit wider context concerning the current option. Thank you very much. So I, I think Gaza is either going to um, remake the UN or it's going to be the end of it. We have tried to manage these conflicts in the Middle East far too long. Syria was a already a big crack, and we can't continue like this. So I have a lot of sympathy for those who criticize the UN, but I think we have, to, we have to try and make it work as much as we can. And what I'm arguing for, essentially, is the internationalization of this conflict. The United States is first amongst equals in peacemaking when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict. But it cannot do it alone. And we've seen it. I was in the Middle East Quartet um, when, when my bosses were, were being represented in the UN at the time. We need a, a new constellation, which is why I've suggested this international contact group, which includes regional states, Turkey included, Egypt, Jordan, um, of course, as well as the UAE. Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Um, we need that. We need an international conference, which is probably jointly sponsored by the U.S. and China. China needs to play a role here um, as well. That's how we create the internationalization in a practical way, which enables us to go forward, which involves a much broader uh, group of countries um, as well. Failing that, I think we're going to, to have a real breakdown. Let me say one final thing. Internationalization is in Israel's interest too. The resistance axis, as we have seen, is getting stronger and stronger. We warned the Israelis this in 2000. We warned them in 2006. I was in Lebanon as well through that war. There is a crisis of legitimacy which is also being talked about when it comes to the state of Israel by many around the world. So internationalization and mutual security and recognition and prosperity is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you. I would like to depart from uh, Professor Mehmet Akif Reshi's point. It, it's a very good question. Uh, dear Professor, I think if there is no will, we cannot create a will. So, and if there's a will, there's always a way. But the thing is, to be a guarantor, I think is the most arduous task of the contemporary era. So, instead of searching or pushing countries to have such a will, I think we should look forward for the countries to already have a will. So here, let me once more remind you that uh, a guarantor power has many uh, limitations. You know. 
First of all, you should have consent of the conflicting parties and you should achieve an invitation. Secondly, the guarantor power should be strong, respected, capable countries with the power of deterrent. Thirdly, you should have full support from the public sphere and your people. Fourthly, you should have a strong and prompt decision-making mechanism. So looking for all this and also thinking about the financial uh, commitment and human risk factor, who will do this? That's the question. And as I said from the very beginning, I don't believe personally that United Nations or peacekeeping operations can handle this. Instead, we should look for countries who has a historical bond with the region, who got a public sphere, who is supporting, you know, their country to be, you know, a guarantor in, in this respect. So, my final words is instead of pushing countries for a will, we should look to countries who already has a will to be guarantor to the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, three very quick points. The first point is about internationalization mentioned by Salman. The problem is that Israel is not willing to accept this inter inter internationalization and the question of trusteeship from a Palestinian perspective. They would want to move to recognition and establishment of a state rather than going into another interim uh, arrangement. And if pressure is mobilized to achieve an objective, they would rather that this pressure is mobilized to achieve a state rather than achieve a, a, a second uh, transitional period. The second point is in relation to the, the role of the United States. Well, the United States is the only power that has huge leverage on this. I've been hearing for the last two decades or more the European Union saying we want to be a player and not only a payer. But I haven't seen them act in a manner that would result in having them become a player in a manner that would be more yeah. effective with all my apologies to my uh, European friends. Uh, Finally, the Avrupa situation is changing. Uh, and I don't think that we should underestimate all yani kinds of developments, yani including yani a developments like what is taking place at the International Court of Justice and the pressure that is being put on the ICC, and also demonstrations around the world that are reflecting a public sentiment that is saying enough is enough. And young people are changing the position of different countries around the world. We have just seen what a small announcement made by the foreign minister of the UK saying that they are considering recognizing a Palestinian state, how this has resulted in a huge debate around the world, whether this can be a step that would change the dynamics of the situation to advance the situation towards effective peace. So I hope that some of these developments would result in more significant change in the recent months to come. And we'll go five minutes overboard <laughs> over time if you, uh, but feel free to leave. Uh, yes, Let me respond to the question here about smart uh, powers. So in the short answer, is yes, being a guarantor is not about being a great power or a superpower. There are good examples of this, Norway and Colombia, or earlier, Norway and Sri Lanka, South Africa and Burundi. It's not necessarily about having a, a huge power as a middle power can also play an effective role. The second thing I'd like to say is that self-interest is not necessarily a bar to being an effective player. And this is where I think this brings us back to the United States, that yes, the overall interest of the United States is not necessarily anything that can be changed by other states. But that doesn't mean that there isn't also within that a self-interest that can be conceptualized or driven uh, more effectively uh, towards a, a better solution. And the last thing I'd like to is to pick up on what the mayor said and just how this illustrates that implementation and action is not only a national or an international endeavor, but very much uh, what happens locally is important. I'll try to uh, briefly respond to both questions um, in the first point. Um, the world should say on its face what is absolutely evident and true. The United States is a party to the conflict itself. 
Okay, it, it's not only in the military sense, but in the diplomatic sense. And the premise that it, the United States um, has for its bias and its closeness to Israel is that by giving it a bear hug, on the back end, Israel's going to listen to it because of its closeness. Um, but that's, that's fiction. I mean, Netanyahu has declared no Palestinian state, not in Gaza, not anywhere, not any time. Um, and as the American poet Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you their soul, believe them. Okay, so there is no U.S. is going to deliver Netanyahu in this government. Um, and why the U.S. continues to cling and support it is something that Turkey and the international community can obviously lobby against and should. There should be a diplomatic coalition of the willing to pressure America, if you're America's friend, to end this unhealthy relationship because it's absolutely undermining the global order, but also um, the United States standing in the world itself. And as to the gentleman who raised um, my seemingly contradictory remarks about the United Nations, I apologize for that. What I was trying to um, illustrate is how the United States has boxed out the UN so that it can micromanage the process to dictate it in Israel's favor. Okay, it was going in a positive trajectory for a number of years. There were Security Council resolutions passed that, um, you know, uh, with respect to um, Israel withdrawing from territory um, along the June 4th, 1967 borders. But as the United States took control of that, discussion over borders became amorphous. Israel, uh, the state of and its geography is like a weather map. Today it's here, tomorrow it's there. It's wherever they want to put a new settlement. We have to get back to the rule of international law and the role of the United Nations. And to do that, we have to, again, push in the international community to reassert the United Nations in a correct way that doesn't have a corrupting American influence. All right, very quickly, um, Dr. Dr. thank you very much. Um, it's my power, absolutely. I think uh, when I was talking about the constellation of the uh, roles uh, in the Grand Turkey, that was very much the, my starting point, because with usual actors and with usual methods, I'm afraid we are not going to go far with many environments of Grand Turkey, particularly with Gaza. And there are three observations. I really urge everybody to decolonize their thinking about this whole issue. I think we are really approaching this from a perspective of Grand Turkey, trusteeship. These are very much the languages of the past era. We are talking about the colonial era of thinking about, you know, like how to resolve this issue. We really need to start thinking about the, the interest of the conflict themselves. And so that's number one. The number two, I think it's really important that it's not only the, the intervening parties and their influence, but it's the influence of the conflicting parties over the Grand Turk actors. So the U.S. in the context of Gaza and the U.S.-Israeli relations. So that side of the relationship, I think, is really important, and um, we need to consider that. And the third issue, I think we need to just bear in mind that um, why some actors want to be guarantor uh, actors in the case of Middle East conflict. Is that really for Palestine and Israel and the security or their own interest? Uh, this whole, you know, the political agenda of certain parties, I would really urge them to come with accountability for their interest to intervene and all their success indicators to uh, so two very quick and concluding remarks from my end. I also want to acknowledge the important point made by Naya Aysa Hassis on the importance of local ownership, the local solutions and local possibilities. Uh, it is essential to engage uh, you know, the local actors on the ground on, on what they see as possible. And when envisioning the security frameworks and guarantees, I think we also need to keep in mind an important point made by Salman about the need to foster consensus building between the Palestinian uh, political 
responsibility for parties and factions, for functional and cohesive uh, frameworks that are not frameworks that are externally imposed, but internally accepted. And, and, uh, and the final point on really centering the political in all of this. Uh, I think uh, when we speak about Israel and Palestine, there is a risk uh, because of the devastating humanitarian and security situation to limit approaches to the security and humanitarian frameworks with the risk of sidelining the political uh, framework and political dimensions of continued occupation. We know that the roots uh, and core of the violence that we are seeing are political and are linked to unfulfilled political aspirations for self-determination and sovereignty. And we also know that very little progress has been made on the final uh, status issues that could be front and center. And once the escalation and the permanent ceasefire have been achieved, I believe that addressing the political issues is a security guarantee in and of itself. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I we're over time, but eight minutes, Sorry, but very I short. I have to respond to, to the <laughs> colonial charge. Um, my family <laughs> left Pakistan, uh, India at the time of partition. They lost everything um, because of Indian, uh, because of British rule. So. Um, I'm sorry, I think we have to have new, new thinking. We're not, I'm not talking about trusteeship where the international community somehow um, takes over. No, we're talking about an internationalization which provides real protection for Palestinians and which is able to put in place the structure where we can go towards a Palestinian state in a time-bound way with an international mandate. If we don't do that, this is going to go on. We're going to be back here for another 10 years discussing something worse. And, and by the way, don't underestimate the chaos which is going to be sown in such a situation if there isn't these kind of international guarantees and international partnership. And I agree, local, the, the local aspects of the Palestinians who have developed themselves must be brought more to the fore, but that can only happen under international protection. I think. Thank you so much. Uh, we're already <laughs> over time. I wish we had more time to continue this discussion. But I'm sure we'll continue in other uh, formats and, and in other platforms. Um, thank you for all the contributions of our speakers and to our guests.